Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Whilst I'm collating more information on the platform on the northeastern edge of the Giza Plateau, as well as the tomb of Kenkawas, I thought I'd take a quick look at another strange feature of the Giza Plateau that certainly appears out of place. Something I showed at the end of a recent video, but haven't really looked into since. You'd be forgiven if you thought I was showing you a picture of Cusco, Sacsayhuaman or Machu Picchu. Because yes, the stonework is distinctly similar. But this photo is taken in the Western Cemetery of Giza, which is located directly west of the Great Pyramid. The photo in question is from the Digital Giza Archive from Harvard University and it's available online for all to view. And there are hundreds of photographs from the Western Cemetery. Although I'm yet to go through them all, it did bring the complicated subject of the Western Cemetery to life, and I did learn a great deal. I learned that only a handful of Mustabas have this amazing interlocking style of stonework, which I did find particularly strange, and something worth investigating and making a video about. The craftsmanship and precision fitting of these irregular blocks is quite strange, compared to what I've seen of ancient Egyptian architecture almost alien to other well-known features of the Old Kingdom, including the pyramids. Yes, there are other examples, but I think these, which are located in the shadow of the Great Pyramid, are the best I've seen in Egypt. They seem to be focused around the tomb labelled G2101, which, together with the adjoining G2102, seems to display distinctly different stonework to the other Mustabas. They are even shown to have different styles of stonework on this old plan. Actually, looking back at this plan, a Mustaba G2110 also has this strange polygonal stonework, whilst G2100, which sits between the two Mustabas that show this ancient stonework, is clearly made of more regular blocks. As shown in historical excavations at Mustaba G2110, the polygonal blocks form like a second outer layer of masonry, like a casing stone. This photo shows the gap between the two types of masonry. The inside is made of standard, regular shaped blocks of limestone, as are the main burial shafts that go from the roof and down into the bedrock. So, what we are seeing in this row of mustabas looks to be different construction styles for the same type of monument. Let me try and break this down for you. The G2110 Mastaba has an interior made of regular shaped blocks as well as rubble, cased with the amazing polygonal masonry. G2101 also has this amazing polygonal masonry on the outside, but a fill of what looks like rubble. Whilst Mastaba G2100, which sits in between the two, has outer masonry that looks similar to the more regular interior masonry of Mastaba G2110. But, as this photograph shows, the casing stone from the middle Mustaba has clearly been removed. Therefore, the middle Mustaba would have once looked the same as G2110. Egyptologists call G2101 and G2102 annexes of G2100, and it does make sense. Because these two structures have no internal core masonry walls, it looks as though to build these, the original now missing casing stones of G2100 were simply extended to the south, creating the Mastaba shape of G2101, and then the interior was just infilled with rubble. Then, at a later date, G2102 was created. So, what is clear is that this polygonal stonework was used as a finishing stone, a casing stone. Some viewers will still argue that the polygonal stone structures are older, and have simply been infilled at a much later date with regular stones and rubble to create a mastaba, but this is not the case. Here we are looking at Mastaba G2110 and the gap between the inner masonry and the outer casing, and you can see that the inner side of the casing is rough and so clearly this was never the inside of an older structure, such as a house. Here is a picture of G2101, and you can see the rough interior finish of the casing stone against the rubble. These stones were certainly used for finishing, and are not the remnant of some earlier construction. Before we go further, it is worth asking who these tombs belong to. 
For a start, these tombs are part of one of the earliest and primary clusters of mastabas in the Western Cemetery. These clusters are known as the Nucleus Cemeteries, and the one I'm discussing in this video is widely known as the G2100 Cemetery. The specific mastabas, G2100, G2101 and G2102 all contain very high profile burials from the time of Khufu in the 4th dynasty. The central mastaba G2100 was made for Sedit, identified as Priestess of Neith and she was bestowed the honorary title of King's Daughter. The adjacent structure, G2101 was for Merib, son of Sedit, and he was an important royal official in the time of Khufu. He was known as companion and overseer of royal works and was given the honorary title of King's Son of his body. The smaller annex, G2102, is for Nensa Jirkai I, the daughter of Merib. The fantastic Mastaba adjacent to these, Tomb G2110, was for a man named Nefer, chief of the estate, overseer of scribes of the portfolios of the king, secretary of the king in all places and many more titles. This king could be either Khufu or Khafre. All of these people are believed to be from the 4th dynasty, as are most in this part of the cemetery. All of them have sunken burial shafts and are buried inside the bedrock, which was custom for Old Kingdom burials. This is another reason why I don't think the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid was ever meant for Khufu, because it wasn't custom in the Old Kingdom to be buried above ground. If anything, he was buried below the pyramid, as discussed in my recent series of videos. Again, for those that think that Khufu is not buried beneath the Great Pyramid, you have to ask yourself why are his high officials, and even his own mother, buried around the Great Pyramid, if he himself is not close by or beneath it. In the Western Cemetery, we also find Mastaba G4000, which was occupied by Hemiunu, the vizier to Khufu, likely grandson of Snefru, sealer of the King of Lower Egypt and Chief Justice. Logic alone says that Khufu must be here at Giza, under a prominent structure like the Great Pyramid. Experts who have studied the Western Cemetery structures attest that this interlocking stonework is casing stone, just like what was applied to the pyramids, and I have to agree. The reason that many of the Mastabas don't display this type of stonework is simply because we are looking at the core masonry. They have clearly been stripped of their casing. Furthermore, some of the Mastabas are later, from the 5th dynasty, and maybe there was no casing stones available, and so the outer face of the later Mastabas was just made of regular blocks. The western field contains the major Mastabas of Giza, and the earliest date to the reign of Khufu, but, as stated, burials continued into the 5th dynasty. There is no reason and no evidence to say that any of these mastabas predate the reign of Khufu, and the fact that we find many inscribed chapels, many archaeological finds, including friezes, inscribed stelas and false doors, as well as paintings and hieroglyphs, show that these are Old Kingdom tombs of important people. I believe the casing stone is Chora limestone, due to the quality finish this fine white stone provides. But we have to ask, why were they built with such incredible shapes and fitted together like a jigsaw? Well, for a start, this stonework may look like the ancient stonework of Peru, but the rock type is very different. It's not hard igneous rock, it's very soft limestone, and it must date to the 4th and 5th dynasties of Egyptian history. The logical answer to explain the stonework is that Chura limestone is very easy to fashion, and the reason for the interlocking nature is because maybe there was a surplus of blocks from when the Great Pyramid and the Khafre Pyramids were made. As the blocks were a surplus, they may have been in different shapes and sizes, and so were likely used and cut to fit the mastabas. Some blocks were large, some were small, and some probably were wastage after the pyramid blocks were cut to shape. As the blocks are easy to mould, there would be no need to waste what wasn't used for the pyramid, and they would give the tombs of important royal figures and Khufu's main officials an exquisite finish. With the perfect cuts and seamless joints, once polished it would look fantastic. 
The Chura limestone was already at Giza, so to finish these mastabas wouldn't be too costly, as they wouldn't require extra quarrying and transportation. It is important to note that just because we see different styles of stonework, it doesn't always imply different time periods, which is very different to Machu Picchu. But the Western Cemetery is a great example of how you can find different styles of stonework, but all from the same time period. As the photographs show, we can see the more regular, blocky style of stonework for the core of the tomb G2110, the same style that was used on just about every other mastaba in the Western Cemetery. I would assume that many other mastabas were also cased in the same way, using the soft Chura limestone. We all look at the interlocking stones of Peru, and now Egypt, in awe and amazement. And maybe this is also why such a style was used for the tombs of important people of the 4th dynasty, because it clearly gives the wow factor. An incredible finish to a building project that was to entomb the body of an important person of the Old Kingdom. In Peru, where they use the hard igneous rock, this stonework would be incredibly difficult to do. But in Egypt, by using offcuts of soft Chura limestone, the task was far less difficult. The reason the outer casing is missing from so many mastabas today is because it was likely reused in the past few thousand years for later building projects, maybe by the ancient Egyptians themselves, as well as by the Arabs, including more recent building projects. When I first saw this picture, I thought this was the beginning of a new mystery, but now I don't believe it is. To me, it's just an example of ancient Egyptian architectural finishing, used on the tombs of important people in the Old Kingdom, and therefore it shouldn't be too much of a surprise. I'll end this video by showing you the amazing reconstruction of tombs G2100, G2101 and G2102, created by the Digital Giza Project at Harvard University, whose incredible website and resource I've linked below in the description. Thank you for watching, and please comment, like the video, and subscribe for more videos from Ancient Architects. We are now in the Western Cemetery, looking at a family complex of mastaba tombs from the 4th and 5th dynasties. On the right is the earliest mastaba, anonymous, but we have some clues as to the actual owner. In the middle is a large mastaba belonging to a high official named Mer-Ib, and on the left, Mer-Ib's daughter, Nen Sejur Kai, built her small mastaba in imitation of an actual house with a portico and a porch. We approach the mastaba to the right, the anonymous one, and we can see that one of the burial shafts, the main one, larger than the others, shows these particular T-shaped grooves on one side. These grooves were intended to take a portcullis stone, a large slab that would slide down vertically and lock the burial chamber away to protect it from plunderers. Unfortunately, such portcullis slabs were rarely successful. Through the core of the mastaba, into the bedrock, we now descend to the burial chamber. No one has been here since 1906, when the Harvard University Boston Museum of Fine Arts expedition first excavated the tomb. Thanks to the meticulous photography, drawings, and archaeological documentation, we can reconstruct the exact appearance of this chamber, unseen in color and uninvestigated by anyone since 1906. The casing stones fallen on the floor, the pieces of wood from the coffin, the bones in the canopic pit in the corner of the chamber. All of these elements reconstructed exactly as they originally appeared. Unfortunately, this chamber was plundered in antiquity. Not only can we view the contents of the chamber, but we can pull back into the limestone bedrock and rotate around the shaft and the burial chamber itself, giving us an excellent idea of the proportions and the relationships. In fact, there are hundreds of other similar burial shafts at Giza, and we will be able one day to understand all of the relationships in an effort to reconstruct the chronological development of the necropolis. As we come up back to the surface and look at the exterior walls of the mastabas, we see the empty emplacement belonging to the owner of this mastaba. The bones down in the burial chamber indicate that she was female and died in her 30s, and in fact, She's represented on the walls of the chapel we are now about to enter. This tomb belongs to Mer-Ib, and he is shown inside standing with his mother, Sedit. 
so it is more than likely that the tomb to the right belongs to Merib's mother, Sadit. Inside are four decorated chapel walls showing Merib in various scenes, standing with his mother, receiving offering bearers, and represented between two false doors on the west wall. This chapel was discovered by the Prussian mission under Karl Richard Lepsius in the 1840s, and it was removed entirely to Berlin. Recently, it was reconstructed and is now on exhibition in the Berlin Neues Museum. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.